This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This episode is brought to you by the Seed Sisters, who've been community herbalists for over 20 years. Their work took a turn last March, and they converted their passion for plants, people and the planet into an online course called The Pathway to Peace. It's an engaging seven-day immersive journey with lots of wonderful content. If you suffer from stress or anxiety, this course may well be able to offer you connection to herbs and tools for stress management, better sleep and nourishment for your nervous system. The next course starts again on April the 28th. I did the course myself and it's a really lovely thing to do. It made me stop and take time out and to meditate on the plants that were covered, to smell them, taste them and to think about their properties. This week's guest is Stephen Hackett, head gardener at Horatio's Garden Southwest. We talk about this amazing garden which was designed by Clean for West and is managed by Stephen, with the help of and for the benefit of the staff and patients at the adjacent Spinal Injuries Unit. Stephen begins by talking about the charity. The charity Horatio's Garden started here in Salisbury in 2011-12 uh, in the aftermath of the death of Horatio Chapel, uh, who was a young man who'd been a volunteer here at the Spinal Unit and had already had thoughts about creating a garden uh, when he died uh, in 2011. So it was a natural thing to do to create the garden that he'd dreamt of and, and thought about uh, as, a, as a memorial to him, which, of course, it, it very much is. What wasn't known at the time was that Salisbury wouldn't be the only garden, and now we have gardens uh, all over the country. Um serving different regional spinal centres. So each one is linked to an NHS regional spinal injury centre um, and is there for the benefit of patients who are suffering from spinal cord injury uh, and are in the hospital often for months at a time, undergoing rehabilitation from what is obviously a, a life-changing injury for them, uh, both physically um, but also in, in terms of the mental and emotional uh, reaction to what's happened. So uh, they're very much in need of somewhere like a garden to go. And that's one of the things that Horatio himself had identified early on was uh, what they were crying out for the patients was an outdoor space because they were stuck indoors um, for months on end, staring at the wall, staring at the ceiling, which is not conducive to feeling well under any circumstances. And so uh, the idea of creating a, a garden, which would be a, a haven for them, somewhere they can get outside, feel the sun on their faces, hear the birds sing, uh, sit in the rain if they want to, you know, just just get away from being in a hospital uh, environment, a clinical environment, as much as possible. Um, what wasn't known in the first instance was that the idea would uh, take off and Horatio's gardens would end up being built in other spinal injury centres around the country. Um, so at the moment we have five in different parts of the UK. We've got a, a sixth just starting work in, in Cardiff and uh, a seventh in Belfast, which will be uh, underway shortly. Um, so, you know, it's grown uh, out of beyond anybody's imagining, I think, uh, as a project. But that's largely because it's been seen to be such a success uh, for the patients and, the, and indeed the staff who work with them. Um, here in Salisbury, the um, garden was designed by Cleve West, uh, who I'm sure is well known to your listeners. Uh, anybody who doesn't know him, he's a fantastic designer, he's won Chelsea Gold medals and so on, and uh, it's, it's just a, a, a lovely, a lovely guy as well as a really good designer. So it's a pleasure to work with him. Uh, he's still very closely involved in the project and visits, uh, regularly to advise and just keep an eye on things. So that's, that's terrific. Uh, for me as a gardener to work with somebody of that caliber. The garden site was originally just a rather tatty area of grass, which is, I don't know, supposedly a sort of recreational area but it was rough scruffy grass and, and so on so um, it wasn't really used by anybody at all and it was right next to the spinal center so it's the ideal location uh, for the garden and 
And there we go. So, yes, it was it opened in 2012. Uh, so we're just coming up to our ninth birthday this summer. Yes. So you mentioned, obviously, it's good for people to get outside. They don't want to be cooped up on a ward. Um, but what is there evidence to, to show that these gardens help people with spinal injuries? And if so, in, in what way do they help them? There is evidence. I mean, there are, there are two sorts of evidence, at least, I suppose. One is the, I guess you'd call it anecdotal evidence, just the day-to-day -day contact that I and others have with the patients using the garden or have been using the garden and their response, which may be articulated because you know they, they may say to us how much they're enjoying the garden or they're liking this or liking that aspect of the garden at a particular time of year. Uh, sometimes, to be honest, it's just the look on their faces. <laughs> you, you can see you know, they're smiling, they're sitting with their eyes closed, enjoying the sunshine or whatever it is. So, the, so there's that level of evidence. We do as a charity annually undertake more qualitative research into uh, the benefits of the garden to patients and how they're feeling, um, how it's helping them with their rehabilitation. Uh, because obviously, your state of mind and so on is very important to your physical rehabilitation. The two things aren't, aren't separate at all. So whilst on the clinical side, everything is being done that's possible to help people to recover to whatever degree uh, they may be able ultimately from the spinal cord injuries. Um, you know, I think the garden is particularly uh, adept at providing them with the emotional and psychological uh, healing um, that you know is harder to get in a purely clinical environment. Uh, but the two complement each other absolutely. So when we when we survey patients, you know, they overwhelmingly say that having access to the garden has improved how they feel about their stay in hospital. It's improved how they view the future. It's in, improved the quality, for example, of, of visits. When they have visitors to see them, they can come out in the garden and, and sit outdoors. And uh, if they've got children, they can, you know, the children can run around outside. They're not cooped up, perched on the end of a hospital bed and so on. So there is a lot of qualitative evidence here and, and a growing amount of other healthcare settings of the real tangible benefits that access to green spaces can provide in, in getting people better. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I was really interested, actually, in when I was researching the charity. Um, obviously, your role as a gardener, I think, is is in one way what you might expect of a gardener, but in another way, it's not a typical one because you work so closely with the charity and also with the NHS. So I wondered how much do you um, input into the therapy side of things and vice versa? How much of the gardening activities are dictated by the needs of the staff in the hospital? It's certainly not a typical head gardener job. Um, I've done this kind of job myself in the past, and it, it's it's much broader, much more complicated in in some respects um, than that. Because, as you rightly say, uh, you know the garden is there for a particular purpose, uh, which is to serve the needs of the patients and to be a therapeutic space. Um, some of that through just being a lovely space to be in, as I've, as I've said. Um, but also some of it through much more specific and targeted activities which we provide for patients. So, uh, for example, um, they might be getting involved in things like seed sowing and bulb planting uh, in the greenhouse that we have or outdoors. They can grow things which they can then see planted out in the garden or in some of the planters and, and um, raised beds that we we have um, uh, they can you know if they're here at a particular time of year they you know if they're here now for example they could sow a tomato seed this afternoon and possibly you know they might still be here um, later in the year when the tomatoes are actually ready to eat which is um, you know one small benefit of of being stuck in the hospital for such a long time, so you can you can work with the patients over a length of time. They're not they're not sort of flitting in and out, uh, and you really get to know them and develop a, a relationship with them. Find out what they're interested in in terms of gardening. Many of them have been gardeners themselves. They're interested to know how, if they're 
going to be uh, using a wheelchair in the future? You know, how how is that going to impact on their ability to to garden? And there's a lot of uh, experience and advice that we can we can share about how that might work. Um, because people miss their gardens at home and they're fearful of not being able to go back to gardening. But um, there are ways that we can uh, we can do that. Um, and as I say, the garden is has to be a space which, as much of the year as possible, uh, is uh, you know, a pleasurable space to be in, uh, in terms of both the plants, but also the general environment. So we have a lot of birds and a lot of insects and wildlife in the garden, uh, which people are very engaged by. Um, and it's, uh, although it's in the middle of a busy hospital, it's, um, it's a surprisingly quiet and tranquil space. It has an atmosphere which is which is very calming and, and um, conducive to feeling relaxed and, and uh, sort of letting some of your worries and cares uh, go. So that's that's another aspect of it that I think is is really important. I mean, just a bit more about the uh, in terms of the job. Um, although the job is is labelled head gardener, and obviously. One of the primary functions is to make sure that the garden is well maintained and and uh, and so on, so that people can enjoy it. But also, um, the volunteers' engagement in the garden has been uh, seriously uh, limited over the last twelve months because of uh, COVID and so on. So we've had only a, a, a very small handful of volunteers able to come in compared to usual. So some of the things we do, like a regular supply of homemade cakes and so on for patients uh, have had to be put on hold, uh, but we're, we're very hopeful that that will resume as soon as we possibly can, uh, and that will bring the garden back into full life. It's um, you know, it's very much a community of volunteers, myself, uh, patients, the clinical staff, and and others who all work together, and that's really been something that's been very restricted sadly over the last twelve months. And the, however. I would say that the patients, I think, more than ever over the last 12 months have really benefited from having access to the garden because for long periods of time, they weren't allowed any visitors, um, so they couldn't see friends and family. Um, and they ordinarily, you know, patients can go out on, on days out and visits and so on, um, organised from the hospital side, but that's all been curtailed. So the garden, I think, has served more than ever its its uh, purpose to the patients and i think you know everybody now has an insight a bit to what the patients en encounter in the sense of we've all um had a sense over the last 12 months of what it's like being stuck indoors and staring at the four walls and those of us who've got gardens and, and green spaces at home or near our home have really valued that so i think we it's given us a real insight um all of us to to what what difference it makes for the patients yeah definitely i think you are you know like although we are only getting a tiny glimpse of what it is like um of course i think we can all appreciate the benefits of gardens um i mean in terms of the garden layout and probably the built features um i'm assuming those would have been dictated by cleve and his design but you i guess have to plan year to year for activities and uh, things uh -huh. that will benefit the patients so did you need uh -huh. to undertake additional training to enable to enable you to do that the garden was designed entirely with the needs of the patients in mind so um cleave was apparently i wouldn't hear them but apparently he was uh wheeled around in a in a wheelchair to get a sense of what the garden would look like from seated position and the heights of the planting and so on all relate to that um and i suppose the one feature of the garden that's most striking for people is that we have for a garden of its size a significant amount of paved areas um which allows patients in wheelchairs and in, in, in beds to be moved around the garden or move themselves around the garden easily um to enjoy it so uh if you look at a, a bird's eye view of the garden it's almost 50 percent uh, plants, but it doesn't feel like that when you're in it because it's quite immersive a lot of the plants are very tall herbaceous perennials um, and you sort of get submerged by the plants in different parts of the garden um, it's, a, it's a sort of cocooning uh, space which is which is a lovely thing to experience um, 
I didn't personally uh, have any experience as a, as a therapeutic gardener. And indeed, uh, up until recently, I worked alongside the garden therapist at the garden. But I am now in the process of, of um, taking that on myself and, and getting some training. So uh, that's something I'm very excited about about doing. So that will bring the two halves of my job really more closely together than has been the case in the past. Maybe you can't answer this then if you weren't around during the design phase, but I did wonder how much do garden users have any input into the way that the garden's designed, but also in the way that it's managed year on year? The garden is, I suppose, in two parts, really. The main garden has the permanently planted borders, which are maintained very much in accordance with Cleve's original planting design. And as I say, Cleve uh, regularly pops down to, to have a look. Although at the moment, we're just doing a few tweaks to that because obviously nine years on, some plants have got a bit big and some plants haven't done as well as others. So we're just readjusting uh, some of some of those areas. But that's very much um, with the, the, the permanent planting. Uh, it changes, it evolves. Cleve is very open to suggestions and and developments he's not sort of uh, fixed uh in in uh, in stone but um that's the garden that is is really the cleave west garden if i can call it that the other half of of the space um is much more flexible so that's where we have the raised planters we have raised planters on the wheels uh, so they can be moved around and we change those with seasonal planting through the year that's also a space where patients can themselves, if they wish, uh, adopt one of the planters and work with us to, to plant it up according to their own uh, ideas of what they'd like to see. Um, and they can help to maintain those because they're, they're all raised. So if you're in a wheelchair, they're all uh, at the right height to be accessible. So, um, you know, the patients can get involved hands on if they want to, uh, very much. And that's something we, we, we encourage. Um, they help with red heading. They help with all kinds of um, jobs like picking out and potting things on, taking cuttings and all that sort of stuff, depending on the time of year. Uh, and as I say, you know, some of them are keen gardeners and it's great for them to be able to um, get involved in that kind of thing. Have you got any other features on site that are particularly useful from a kind of therapy point of view? In terms of the garden's therapeutic value, um, it is, as I've said, I think primarily about having a very lovely place, which is quiet. We have running water, which is always a very calming, soothing uh, feature to have in a garden. Um, we have a an archway, a cotton steel archway, which runs along one side of the garden, where we have apple trees and wisteria. And in the summer, in particular, because we're up on the top of the hill, so it can get quite exposed and hot in in the middle of. So that for a lovely shady, cool green space, which is which is really nice to be able to use. Um, we have lots of uh, seating around the garden, so that when people have visitors, they can tuck themselves away in different corners and uh, and just feel a bit of privacy and, and a bit of, of personal space. Um, we have the uh, what we call the garden room, which is an indoor space, which is accessible all year round. So. Patients, even in the middle of winter, heated and so on. So even even on a wet, cold, miserable November day, uh, they can come down and sit in there. They can still see the garden. They can watch the birds on the bird feeders and so on without getting cold and wet. Um, and so that, that keeps the garden going all year round. And I think that's another important thing because the patients uh, obviously have no, no influence over what time they happen to be in the spinal injury unit. Um, and it's as important that uh, there are things for them to see and enjoy in the middle of winter, as far as possible, uh, as in you know, in high summer. And the garden really does change character throughout the year um, very much. So uh, you know, depending on when you're here, you'll see the garden in a very different different light. But uh, and, and and this time of year in, in spring, as we speak, uh, you know, things are really starting to emerge uh, from winter. And that's a very exciting and uplifting thing. I mean, it is for all of us. And I think the patients are really responding well to that. I wondered if, as we hopefully look towards a future, including garden visits, um, 
Can members of the public visit any of the Horatio's garden sites? All the Horatio's gardens are attached to NHS spinal injury centres. So obviously access to them is restricted and they exist to be spaces which belong to the spinal injury patients. And so having too many people wandering in and out wouldn't be conducive to that sense of belonging and a sense of peace and, and, and healing that we want to encourage. However, we obviously like people to see our gardens, so we do open, we open to the National Garden Scheme at our various locations around the country, um, and we have other open days, and we do take, uh, by arrangement, visiting groups, um, garden clubs or whatever, um, we organise those tours for people to see the gardens, uh, but that has to be arranged around the needs of the patients, but we're more than keen for people to to see the garden. There's lots of pictures on our website if people are interested uh, and you can follow us on social media and whatnot. So, um, you know, you can see what the gardens are looking like through the year. But if you do get the chance to visit, um, you'll be very welcome. You know, it's, it's great to be able to show people around the gardens, uh, explain our work, show them what we're doing, encourage them to engage with the charity, whether that's through fundraising or volunteering or, or whatever it might be. There are lots of opportunities for people to even if you don't live very locally to one of the gardens, uh, the charity is a national charity. So there are all kinds of opportunities for people to uh, to engage with us. I mean, gardening is rewarding. and But as you've just said, working with people, I think, probably elevates it to another dimension. So perhaps first off, to kind of get the maybe the slightly more negative bit out of the way, what is the most challenging aspect of your job? And then perhaps if you could follow it up with what what's the most rewarding part? The garden is here for the patients 12 months of the year. So we can't put the garden to bed in the autumn and wake it up again when the first daffodils appear. Uh, there has to be something there, even in the depths of winter, uh, for people to look at. So you know, we work quite hard to make sure that the planting uh, works for as much of 12 months as it possibly can within the constraints of nature, obviously. But we have greenhouse and we have the garden room so we have indoor spaces where we grow other kinds of things that people can enjoy and the most rewarding aspect i mean i wonder if once you kind of garden i think with people in it can you go back to do you think going going back to a garden working where there aren't people there isn't that sort of element of activity in it most of the time uh i have no desire to really i have worked in gardens which have you know a couple of gardens i've worked in previously which were fantastic gardens but uh the only people who ever saw them were the owners and in one particular case a garden i worked in where the owners were very seldom there themselves so you know <laughs> that it was a lovely garden but very who who knew um apart from me really i had the benefit of it i suppose but um here no i mean every day um patients the staff uh are in the garden commenting on the garden spotting things that i might have missed which is quite quite good quite a, have extra pairs of eyes just keeping an eye on the on, on weeding that might need doing or whatever um engaging with our volunteers when they're when they're here you know just really a team a community as i said earlier uh in the garden so it's really hard to imagine how that uh how it would feel not to have that because um it, it's hugely rewarding uh, the garden is just enjoyed and valued and benefits people so much. I mean, many of our volunteers, as well as being hugely helpful to me in maintaining the garden and looking after it, um, benefit greatly from coming in and seeing each other, seeing the patients and, and so on. There's a real, a real community sort of family aspect to it, which I think is not something I've ever encountered in, uh, in a garden before. And as, I think you're right. It would be hard to imagine going back to working on one's own in a garden uh, without that. I think it would be quite hard. Yeah, I agree. I I currently work um, for a charity that does horticultural right. therapy, and um, okay, and it does. It it just adds a, di a different element. And I always say, think you know, gardens are either lacking in kind of animals or people. I like to have them full of all of the above. There has to be a a living space um and you know for some people the garden is, is a social space for many of the patients it's just a place to come and chat with other patients or, or their friends and family
some some are really engaged in the planting side of things, the horticultural side of it. Some are much more interested in watching birds or butterflies, bumblebees, the things that we have in the garden. It's a, it's a fantastic garden for wildlife um, because of the planting, the, both the length of the season, but also the variety of plants that we grow. Um, I always say it's it's living proof that you can have a, a very rich wildlife garden without it being scruffy or full of weeds, which a lot of people tend to assume wildlife gardens must look like that. Um, and whilst there is a place for the odd un corner, we don't we're not able to do that because of the nature of the garden. But nevertheless, it's absolutely full of uh, of wildlife. So that's something that people enjoy enormously. Thank you to Stephen for talking about his garden and about the fantastic work the charity does. I'd like to draw your attention to the links to the Horatio's Garden Spring Raffle and the Summer Art Auction. You can find links to both in the show notes if you'd like to support the charity. Thanks to you for listening and thanks to the Seed Sisters for supporting this episode. Please also check out their online course in Sensory Herbalism, which starts on the 28th of this month. I picked this week's Bug of the Week as I saw the first one of the year a couple of days ago and I was very excited. So here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about brimstone butterflies. There's only four of our native butterfly species that during winter hibernate as adults. And the first of these to awaken, letting us know that spring really has arrived, is the brimstone. An extraordinarily beautiful butterfly with leaf-shaped and veined wings that can be seen throughout England and Wales, fluttering across gardens, searching for nectar to replenish the energy that they'll have lost over the winter months. The stunning male brimstones are thought to be why the word butterfly was first created, to describe their radiant butter yellow wings, which are quite different from the female's pale pastel green colour. Besides their distinctive wing colour and its unique shape, the brimstones also have another distinguishing feature in that they'll never be seen at rest with their wings open. So on warm sunny spring days it's common to see the males and females engaged in their lengthy courtship flights that eventually end with them vanishing amongst the plants to mate, perfectly camouflaged amongst the leaves. Once mated the females fly off to search for a buckthorn bush where they'll begin laying small white bottle-shaped eggs singly onto a leaf or an open bud. Egg laying continues for a number of weeks until the end of June when the adults all die. Their eggs, however, will have been hatching into tiny green caterpillars around 10 days after they were laid. Caterpillars that will begin feeding along the mid-veins before devouring whole leaves as they grow larger and mature. After four weeks, the caterpillars will leave their host plant, descend to the ground and find suitable places to become pupae, within which they'll metamorphose into the next generation of brimstone butterflies that will hatch and emerge from the undergrowth two weeks later. These fresh, new, beautiful brimstones won't be interested in mating though, but instead they'll gorge themselves on summer nectar building up their reserves to survive for up to eight months hibernation before they emerge the following spring when the annual life cycle begins once again. For anyone who admires the brimstone butterflies, it's very easy to help them within our gardens. Simply ensuring that there's plenty of nectar-rich summer and spring flowering plants, as well as a buckthorn or alder buckthorn bush somewhere amongst the plantings. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All podcast.